Okay, I'm back. And I had a nice bath and my hair takes forever to dry. I like to air dry it. But I wanted to talk about my thyroid condition and why my mouth is always dry because it's definitely this medication. Honestly, I think I've always had it. Not always. I think I've had, as soon as I started developing, <laughs> you know, as a woman having hormones, I think that's when most women get it. And so I feel like that if you're a little heavy or if you're a little too thin, that's probably the problem. And you, you need to have your doctor do a test, do a thyroid test. I didn't know what the hell I had. There was a time somewhere in between age 16 and 18. I can't even really gauge when it was. I've talked about it before. I'm like, when was that? Because I had, there was a time period I put a lot of weight on and I was, it, I hardly ever ate. I was on the run constantly and I didn't know what was wrong with me. And I was, I was getting stoned, smoking out with my friends, but not all the time. I didn't really do it that often. It was just on occasion. And I was all puffed out. That's what my dad used to say. He's like, you're all puffed out. And I guess I didn't really mind it. You know, I had big boobs. You know, that was good. <laughs> That's like the advantage, I guess. But I didn't mind it. I don't think anyone should really, if you're healthy, I don't think anyone should mind it. You know, I think, um, I think it was different for me because I wasn't feeling well. I wasn't feeling my best. And your thyroid affects everything. And I never really knew anything about the thyroid. I really didn't. If I did, I could have probably avoided having panic disorder altogether. Because the thyroid, if it's too fast, it causes you to have anxiety attacks and to lose your hair and to lose weight and to have really dry scalp, skin, um, all kinds there's so many symptoms there's so many horrible things that happen and if you have too much weight on you um, usually it's because your thyroid is so freaking slow and it doesn't move fast enough for you to burn off the calories or to really function properly it really doesn't have that much to do with how much yes okay some people have the disease called obesity I hate that people think that certain people just are overweight and they're obese and they're fat. No, they're not. They they have problems too. They have some something's not working with their system. You know, if something's off, it's an imbalance, which causes them to put on a lot of weight, but to keep it on. And then they get depressed and then it's like a cycle. And then they're like, okay, I need to eat more now. I'm going to eat more because their body's craving it. They're, your body is needing more to keep yourself going. So um, weight issues or underweight issues, they're both really difficult to deal with. And they both are not necessarily your fault. Yes, some people have anorexia and they starve themselves or they throw up. Or what have you you know um, bulimia you throw up anorexia is where you just don't eat and then you starve yourself and exercise excessively and I think body image issues like I had where I always thought I was fat um, caused me a lot of problems in that business you know it was in that business and it was because when I, my thyroid started slowing down, when I first started developing, it's a hormonal thing as well. Everything's connected. Uh, I became really just depressed and I thought I was fat because everyone kept telling me, oh, you have a lot of baby fat on you. Uh, the camera puts 10 pounds on and photographers sometimes liked it because it shows that you were young. And that's why so many women today get needles injected in them to puff their faces out and I don't know if anyone's watching Big Brother Celebrity I just, I tried to watch tonight and I'm like I don't even know if I'm gonna continue but Shana I think it's Shana Mokler she's had some injections in her face so it's all puffed out 
and um, because that's what she feels makes you look younger. I don't think so. I think she looked better before. I Maybe she'll stop doing it. Who knows? All I'm saying is that when I was younger, I definitely had some weight on me. And then I kept it off on purpose. You know, I purposely would skip meals and work out. I mean, I lived in Brentwood at one point with these two other girls. And we lived maybe a few, a few blocks from the gym. And I was there every freaking day. And I would see people that really were struggling with their weight staring at me like, you know, like, what the fuck are you doing here? I know it's true. I don't know. You know, I could see um, strength training, you know, um, developing muscle is really what I needed. But instead, I would be like on the treadmill, you know, like trying to burn off calories. And I was like a bone. And it was because of um, the fact that I had weight on me and I didn't know. So then I had like a hypothyroidism where my thyroid was so, so fast that even in, even when I did eat, it would just burn off. And I never knew what the fuck was wrong with me, you know? And I, have fr I had friends growing up that they rarely ever, like they didn't pig out. I never watched them pig out, but they just couldn't take the weight off. So it was either that or this. It's always some kind of back and forth. And it's really hard to get the right medication and the right balance. But with me, I think when I was younger, when I had um, a very slow thyroid, and I got it, I got it again later. And the picture that I showed, I'm going to put up a few pictures and to show that I was a little chubby. I had some chub chubs, and it was okay. For some reason, I, I really didn't care about it until I started going to those Hollywood parties in auditions and people would say things like, well, you're going to have to lose some weight. And, um, you know, it was, it was really difficult. You have to be comfortable in your own skin. Oh, God, I don't know what the hell's going on. I cut my hair again. <laughs> okay. So I went through a period when I was caring for my father where I put a lot of weight on and, <sighs> I was just puffed out, my dad said. He said, you're all puffy. And it wasn't, obviously it wasn't me, but it was also, um, it did, had nothing to do with the weight, really. I could care less. I wanted to be healthy. And I went to go see his doctor, this woman who was, she was horrible. Every time I would go see her, you know, she would just make me feel bad. And she would put me on medication and take me off and put me on just so I would go through with the withdrawals and the changes. And like when I was skinny, she was like, Ugh. God, you're so skinny. I wish I was that skinny. I wish I was skinny because she had a little weight on her. And I, she, I was honest when I said, I wish I had some of your weight. I wish I wasn't so skinny. And at my job, when I was, you know, working in uh, management at Saks Off Fifth, people actually would talk about how skinny I was behind my back, but I would hear them. I couldn't fit into any of the normal clothes. Everything was too baggy on me. And I didn't see myself as being skinny. You know, I just, it was horrible. It was such a bad time. And so I look at pictures of myself <sighs> back and forth, the back and forth of the weight. And I always thought that it was the person inside. I thought it was individual. I thought, okay, well, obviously I'm just not eating enough or obviously I'm eating too much. There was always that, um, the yo-yo, you know, it was always the back and forth and I never really knew how to treat it. And then when I almost died, when it was because my thyroid just basically stopped, it was, which affects everything in your whole body, everything's connected. And so when you're, thyroid is so slow and I was skinny too. You usually when your thyroid is slow, you put on a little weight because your thyroid can't keep up with the calories that you're bringing in and what have you. But I had no thyroid. I mean, I couldn't, they could not find my heartbeat. I remember just walking across the room. I felt my heart go boom, boom, boom. And it would stay like that. You know, I didn't have anxiety anymore, obviously. I, there was no room for that. It was 
my heart wouldn't beat. And so just answering the door or anything like that, it was really exhausting. And so the picture that I showed of me in the dirty mirror is I didn't have the energy to clean. I mean, I was like, I could barely move, let alone clean. But I did manage to make my father dinner every single night. And I remember just starting early because it would take so long. And then I was just, it was such a bad time when I, all the times when I was too skinny, when I was a little chubby, I mean, I prefer having a little weight on me. And so when the doctor would say, oh God, you're so skinny. I wish I was you. And I say, I wish I was you. And I would see people out and I would say, God, I wish I would just have a little bit. I wish I looked like that. And it was always someone that filled their clothes out. Someone that um, could lose weight, but really didn't need to, I didn't think. You know what I mean? For, for me, that was the fantasy. And that's what people don't realize is that skinny people might not necessarily want to be skinny. I think that either they're being pressured into it, maybe they don't have a thyroid condition, but in some cases, in a lot of cases I found, especially lately, a lot of people I know have this disease. That's what it is. They don't really, don't be jelly. Mm-mm. Um, it's not fun to be that skinny. I see models all the time. You can see the rib cage, and I don't think that's sexy. I used to, you know, when I was modeling, I thought, God, I have to be really skinny, and oh, I can't have any fat on my stomach, not even like a, I can't pinch any fat, nothing, you know? And I remember when I got my belly bit, uh, button pierced, uh, the girl that didn't did it that ended up being my roommate for a while, and that's a whole other story, but she couldn't find any skin to like do it. And she found just enough, just a tiny little bit. And it ended up being pulled out so easily because there's like this tiny little bit of skin. And so there's still like a little scar there. But okay, so when I was caring for my dad, I put on a lot of weight and I couldn't walk across the house without feeling like Obviously, my thyroid was working overtime to just get me across the house. And one time I went to the grocery store with my dog. And my dog was in the car. But I remember my heart was beating. I was in the grocery store. and my, It wasn't a panic attack. Actually, it could have been if it wasn't for the thyroid. It could have turned into one. But um, it starts with like a hot flash. You know, you feel like... <gasps> and then all of a sudden, my heart just goes boom, boom. Boom. And you could actually feel it doing that. Like it's like a cartoon or something. And I dropped my little basket that I was holding, it had my wallet in it. And I walked to the car and I just sat there and I was, I could not stop it from beating that fast. But at the same time, I thought if it stops, then I'm going to die. I felt like I was going to die. And my dog was barking. She was crazy. She's like losing her shit. And she thought someone hurt me maybe. So she's like barking out the window and just freaking out. I had to go back in to get my wallet. And so I walked back in and the cashier had my wallet. And she's like, oh, here's your wallet. I knew, I, I was hoping you'd come back. She's like, are you okay? She goes, I've had what you have. And I said, you've had panic attacks or? She's like, no, you're suffering. Is it your thyroid? I said, no, it's. I, mean, I, I didn't even think about the thyroid. It didn't even cross my mind. But um, I didn't know about the thyroid until I lost all the weight and I was 77 pounds and I thought I was going to die. And from what my, the doctor said, if I waited any longer, I probably, my heart just would have stopped, just stopped altogether. And um, because I was so skinny um, and I wasn't eating, I couldn't eat. And that's not the reason why I was skinny. It was because my heartbeat was so slow that um, I would get sick every time I ate because it wasn't, there's was no digestive system that was working properly. It's all a big thing, okay? <laughs> so I have to just post some pictures of the symptoms and which is which and blah, blah, blah. It's just really complicated and it's something that I never knew about. So here, there I was taking care of my father and I was puffing out as he would say and there's that picture of me in the dirty mirror and I was all puffed out but if you look at pictures of me from the past I was 
uh, you know, I had that same thing going on and I didn't really know it. I was like, you know, I'm just, you know, I have baby fat, but I remember feeling that way, like the heart popping out of my chest and all of that. And I thought it looked good then too. I thought, you know, when I was a little puffy, I thought, oh, I look good. And I do. I think that women are so beautiful when they just rock what they have. And I think being skinny is, is there's a sickness involved both, both ways. If you're overweight, like if you're 300 pounds, obviously there's some, something going on with your system. It probably is thyroid. You probably don't have enough energy to burn it off. So when people say, oh, they're just lazy and fat, like, fuck you. No, they're not. You know, it's not, yeah, maybe there's a few out there, but on the most part, I do believe that these people have sick, a sickness, whether it's the disease of obesity or a thyroid condition, there's something going on there, you know, that, that the doctors have to look into and test for. And I think a lot of them don't do that. Okay. So I was looking up the thyroid disease. Oh, okay. I want to finish my story. I always get off track. Okay, so I was a little overweight, um, and then he got kidnapped. My father, to me, it was full-blown kidnapping, a heist. It was, and I remember feeling like this rush, you know, and this like adrenaline out of nowhere. It was like, and it was, it was nervous energy. It could have been a panic attack, but instead I kind of used that. And I had this, uh, kid next door that, you know, he was stealing from my dad. He was, but instead of calling the cops and getting him arrested, like I could have done, I used it to my advantage in a way because I didn't have anyone. I was totally, I was completely alone. My brother was the only one there for me, but he wasn't local. He was in Florida at the time, I think. And, um, so yeah, he had, he had to work, you know, he couldn't really be there. But he was, he had my back 100 and, you know, I always appreciated that. And he hated, hated my sister. We all, I told you that. Okay. So the kid next door, I, he, he's a grown man. He's a grown ass man. I need to stop calling him that. <laughs> but when I met him, you know, he was like a teenager, you know? So to me, he's the kid next door. And, um, I needed his help. I needed to run out of room. That's what I thought. I thought I need to run out of room. Everything will be fine. <sighs> and so he helped me. My dad stored all of his stuff here. He was like a hoarder, but the truth is he, he, he lost his storage unit and needed to store his stuff here. And that's a whole other story, huge, long story. I'm not going to get into it. I I'm sure I will eventually. And so the kid next door, the grown ass man next door, the one that bought him the slippers that he fell in and all of that. Yeah. The ring, he stole the ring off my dad's pinky finger. Um, I could have put him in jail. I mean, easily, but, um, he really did acknowledge what he did was wrong at that time. And he was willing to help me and we needed each other, I guess. I needed his help. And so, I mean, I even had videotape of him and I still have it to this day. And he said that I'm lying. Now I have videotape of him at the bank with my dad getting money out. Um, so yeah, just I also have a video of, um, the ring shows in the, in the video on camera. It's, it's crazy how much people don't know that I hold my cards very close to my chest and the people that have done me wrong, I have evidence against them for things that they have no idea about. They know what they did was wrong. They know that, but they don't know that I could, I have enough evidence to destroy them. And it's because I've been fucked over so much in my life, especially with my family. With my family, you have to have backup. You have to, they will, not my whole family, my sister in particular and her kids. And so, yeah, I got everything I needed for that, but I also have ev evidence against him and I haven't used it. And it's because during a time period that I needed help 
for free because he already had taken so much from my father, even though I would give him money here and there, you know, and I needed him to be there. So I got him a cell phone. It, it worked out somehow. I know people are going to say you're fucking crazy and all of that, but, um, I got him a phone because he didn't have one and there was times that I needed him. So instead of sending someone to prison, it's almost like I was rehabilitating him, but to my benefit. It was a strange thing. And I think it really did help him. I do. I, you know, he's obviously not that same person, but he won't acknowledge what he did. He just won't. And even though I have so much proof, it's whatever. The point is that I had someone to help me. And so we, we went through all of my dad's things and through that process of going from being completely, um, basically sitting in a damn chair every day, all day, wondering what was going to happen next and having my thyroid just so slow that I could barely function to f having no choice, but to force myself into this action, you know, um, being proactive in my life, getting off the seat, take making, and it took a long time and I had help. He would do all the hard stuff, obviously, but I had to get up and do things and, I didn't know I had a thyroid condition. I didn't know what was going on, but I knew that little by little, um, I got myself back to a place that was hype. It was like hypothyroid. It was the total freaking opposite. I got to that place where I lost all this weight, not in a good way, organized the house, started working my ass off, um, to try to pay off that loan against the house. And I paid off a lot. I paid off so much. But, um, then I was too skinny. So not only that, I was back in school, I was back in school full time, not part time. I had my own business and I was working every day, all day. I was excited about life. I thought I'm going to get my dad back. You know, I'm going to get my dad back. I'm going to make enough money to pay off the loan, get my dad back, do all of that. And I could have, that's the thing I probably could have. But then, um, my dog dies, my Lacey, my little beautiful, my, my soulmate, you know, I always say that I'm like, I remember my ex said that the dog that we had before was the love of his life, but that's how Lacey was for me. You know, she was stuck. She stuck by me through everything and she, she had to, she was my dog. She was loyal. But the thing is that I never really knew how to love to that, that level. It was like the first animal pet that I fell in love with and was so loyal to and was so loyal to me because before that I'd only know heartache from humans. You know, I had a cat before that. I had a, a Persian cat named Sky, but I, as I said, I got sick. And so the neighbor needed him more than I did. He was suffering through cancer and going through treatments. And so he went to live with the neighbor. And I was really, really sick. That's another thing. That's when I started having panic attacks. And I was really skinny once again. So I'm thinking the thyroid was happening and going on then. I'd never been so sick. I never felt. I would be like on the kitchen floor in fetal position just shaking and crying. It was that bad. And I didn't know what to do. I was scared. And, um... I just wanted to die. I just say, God, just take me now. I'm, I can't, I don't want to live anymore. I can't survive this. I'm in so much pain and I, I don't trust anybody. It was really bad. And so, uh, when it, after Lacey died, it happened again where I got really, really skinny and my thyroid just stopped. And that's when I ended up weighing like 77 pounds and I couldn't even work anymore. I was getting behind on all my bills and then I met, um, well, okay. I asked my ex if he could get me a doctor over here and he says, I can't help you. I, we're not together anymore. And my partner wouldn't, enjoy, wouldn't appreciate that. His partner or his companion or whatever the fuck. And I was like, I, I think I'm dying. I really, I could barely even talk to him. Like my, I couldn't even speak and 
I was so weak and I just, so then my other friend, um, my friend Wally, uh, he didn't even think about it. So, so amazing. He sent someone over here. They looked me over. She was trying to find my pulse and she had like two nurses with her and somebody else that was, um, there to check to see if I had food and all of that. Somebody just, you know, a nutritionist and she couldn't find my heartbeat. She tried everything all over my body to try to find that heartbeat. And she goes, how are you still walking? How are you still alive? Your heart, you don't even have a heartbeat. She goes, how much do you weigh? She's like, do you have a scale? You know? And so I broke out the scale and it was like 77 pounds. And she's like, if we don't get your weight up in the next few days, at least a pound, you're going to have to go into a hospital. This is, I, I, I said, I don't want to go to a hospital. I don't want to go to a hospital. She's like, you better start working to get this straight. And this medication I'm going to give you is going to help you do that. And she gave me a thyroid medication. And so she says, you have a thyroid disease. And she goes, she goes, they took a test. The first day she didn't know, she took a test and um, by the time she came back, she already knew what I had. But she had that guy. He, I guess he's a nurse. I'm not sure. He's a nutritionist, nurse, what have you. He came over every day for months to weigh me, um, to make sure I was taking my medication, and to make sure I had food, which was amazing. I couldn't even believe. It saved my life. Between Wally and this doctor and the nurses, they saved my life. And they also sent a therapist over, which was amazing because of all the things my sister did. And then me being a caregiver for my father for seven years, I had complete caregivers burnout and I wasn't taking care of myself because I was so focused on him. And so people really need to put energy into helping those that are helping others, uh, whether it be nurses, uh, doctors, chiropractors, whoever it is. It doesn't matter if you're just a caregiver for your parent or your loved one or your child or whatever, whatever, whoever it is, your loved one, you need backup and you, you need to be able to take breaks for yourself to take care of yourself. And I didn't have any breaks. Nobody in my family was there for my father and definitely not there for me. And so I was in it alone, you know, I had my friend Bill come over on occasion, but it's like the blind leading the blind. He was just as messed up as me in different ways. He was taking care of his mother. Um, but for my ex-boyfriend, there was just no freaking excuse. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I can't imagine. When we broke up, when he was off doing drugs, I was out there. St I stood by him through all of it. Um, I was there for him during some of the hardest times when his dad died. Who was the one that drove out there? And got into a car accident while doing so. Basically, the minute he died, I got in my car. I said, I'm on my way. I was just here visiting my father. Um, helped him prepare the service, the speech, the music, everything. I was always there for him. So for him not to be there was just unexcusable and kind of unforgivable, you know, as far as I'm concerned. And so um, this doctor came along. She saved me. She told me what I had. And she asked me, she's like, have you had problems, you know, with weight and then whether it's up or down or what have I said, yes. I said, ever since I was around like 17, she goes, well, yeah, you obviously you've had this uh, disease for a long time and I'm surprised no one else has diagnosed it. I said, I am too. You know, what the fuck is this about? I, I went, I had so many different doctors and not one of them. I was so skinny. They didn't even seem concerned. You know, it's, oh, well, you're too, you know, it was, I don't know. I can't even imagine like being a doctor and having a patient that's that skinny. I wasn't 77 pounds, but I was like under 90 and that's not okay. You know, when you could see someone's like, yeah, you know what? I'm kind of been stressed out. So I've been kind of getting that to that point again where I've been losing weight and I don't like it. And so that is why my medication was changed because, um, my doctor thought that she was giving me too much medication and it was making me hypothyroid, you know, like, like I was 
my uh, adrenaline and my thyroid was too quick and it was help making me lose weight. But the reality was that this has just been a very stressful few months and lots, lots been going on emotionally. And so I don't think it's like, you know, but that's why I can't sleep because she, um, she took me down. You would think I would be able to sleep, but because medication, anytime you change it, no matter what kind of medication it is, your body's affected by it. It's all chemical, you know, it's the chemicals become imbalanced and it's crazy. Okay. So, uh, I got really skinny. I started putting weight on again, but this is the key, the, but, uh, I met, I had been kind of talking to, um, somebody online for a long time who lived in the same town as me. We knew, we knew some of the same people. He was older than me. So for some reason we just never met, but he asked me if I, if he could stop by and maybe talk and introduce our dogs. Cause he just got a dog named Charlie and I just, I had, a, I think I got Charlie a few months. No, no, that's, that's wrong. At the time I first saw my doctor, I didn't have a new dog yet. I was mourning the loss of Lacey and then, um, Charlie needed to be adopted and he was already like three and a half years old. And I said, I'll do it. I'll adopt him. And at that time I was kind of babysitting off and on thinking about adopting a neighbor's dog, but it didn't, it didn't work out. It, that's a long story too. That's a long story. And I just wasn't ready. And then when, by the time Charlie needed to be adopted, I realized that I just, I didn't want to be alone. He needed me. I needed him. And so I adopted him and I announced it on Facebook. And so this guy named Michael, he's like, Oh, I just adopted a dog named Charlie. And you know, I said, Oh, cool. We, you know, so he's like, let's meet. So he came over, he saw how sickly I was. And I, I was really honest with him about it. I was like, I am a mess. I'm sick. I don't even know if I'm going to survive. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, so he was really cool about it. And he started bringing me, bringing me pancakes. And when I first met him, I couldn't even speak. Um, barely. He would answer, ask me questions and I would answer. And he would bring me pancakes and I would eat one little bite. And for some reason, every time I tried to swallow, I would get really sick. Because my thyroid, you know, it, the medication wasn't kicking in yet. It takes a while for everything to get straightened out. And so he started bringing me pancakes like every day. I don't know why pancakes don't ask. I, they were delicious, uh, really nice thing to do. So that really helped to have someone here, to have somebody care and to have someone pretty much feeding me, <laughs> you know, saying, look here, here's some pancakes or some bananas, the cream and that's what I got. It was like banana cream pancakes or whatever. And then we tried different ones, you know? So when I first started seeing him, I just said, well, I'd answer questions. Yes, no, whatever. And then I would, um, as the medication started taking into a, coming into effect and, and working, I started eating more and, um, talking more and healing, putting weight on. I remember how excited I was to get to like 80 pounds and then I got to 81 pounds and 85 pounds. And once I got over a hundred, it was like a party. It was like, Oh hell yeah, I'm over a hundred, you know? And then I got to 120. I was like, cool. This is cool. This is fine. You know, everything's fine. It's going to be okay. But it was really a touch and go situation. I don't think, even though this person, I think I talked about him in my last video, even though this person, I'm not sure what happened. I, th he left the door open and the cat got out and what have you. Um, you know, I'm not going to blame him for that. I'm not going to sit here and, you know, bash him for that. He did so much good for me and it, d it definitely turned toxic. Um, it was the circumstances. It was everything. Uh, it was his life too. It was, but for a while, it was probably one of the best things that happened to me because without him, I don't think I would have survived. And so, um, 
he ended up kind of moving in and he was here all the time. And so he fixed up the extra bedroom. There's two extra bedrooms. He fixed up, he's really good at cleaning and just organizing. And um, he did all of that or all my pictures. He organized all of my pictures, my family pictures, everything. But he also made me laugh all the time. He brought out my personality again, the one that I had hidden and locked away for all of those years that I was taking care of my father. You know, I was, <sighs> when you're a caregiver, especially for someone you love more than anyone else in the world, which was my father, he was, he still is my favorite human being that ever lived. You know, he's, yes, there were some things that he, he did wrong. He made mistakes, but, um, to watch him suffer every single day, all day, to lose him, to have him not there mentally broke me. And so I would wake up every day and I would psych myself out and I would say, you don't know this man. This man is not your father. You don't even really like him. He's complains a lot. He shits himself. He turns off. He almost blew up the house. He almost set the house on fire. I had to like psych myself out and tell myself like this man is not your father. You don't even like him. You don't like him. You know, I know that sounds horrible. It was the only way that I could deal with it. I would have to go out there and face him every day. And, um, I couldn't care even though I did, obviously I would come back into my room and cry, but I had to be very stoic and, um, repress everything, my feelings, whatever, whatever it was everything had to be repressed. I would drive down the street sometimes and just park and just cry like a baby and scream. You know, I know that sounds crazy, but I couldn't do that here. Could I, I would just scream out and I would cry and it was like primal. It was that primal scream because I would go on Facebook and I would see all my old friends and their lives were seemed so perfect. You know, they had the husband or the wife and the kids and the white picket fence and you know, they were doing so well in life and here I was and I didn't have anything. You know, I lost everything. You know, I, I gave up my business, my writing, everything to take care of him and my relationship, which like I said, there, it was, I'm glad that it didn't work out. It wasn't meant to be, you know, everything happens for a reason, but, and I'm glad I got to spend those lucid years with my father when he knew who I was and he was still there and he was still able to, um, talk to me and off and on, obviously it got worse and worse, but, um, I was so isolated. I was so alone. Um, that's why it hurts even more. You know, when my niece came and she screwed me over the way she did because I was going through so much, you know, I couldn't leave him alone. And so when she came, of course I went and got laid. <laughs> of course I did. I hadn't in, in years. I think it had been like a few years at that point. I hadn't been with anybody. And me and my boyfriend, had broke. me and my fiance, whatever. I hate that term, fiance. We had broken up. Like it, it was a few years before that. So I just wanted, I didn't want, obviously I couldn't have a relationship with anyone. I couldn't get serious with anyone. I just needed a booty call. That's it. And when they found out he was married, I never saw him again. But, um, sometimes I would have her babysit. I would say, I need to get out. I'm going to go to LA. Can you watch him tonight? She would say, okay, whatever. I'm just going to kick back and order a pizza. And, um, that's what she would do on occasion. But that was the only time I was able to get out. And then my friend, Bill, he got this hotel on the beach and we were going to take, he was a photographer. So, um, he used to be a professional and then he gave it up, but then he was going to start doing it again. So he wanted to do a whole, whole photo shoot and we were such good friends. I've known him since, you know, my early twenties and there was never anything sexual, nothing like that. And, um, he got this beautiful hotel room right on the beach and we went out to dinner and, um, he forgot the battery for his camera the plug-in and the battery, everything. He forgot everything. 
So we ended up not taking any pictures, but we had a great night. The next day we hung out at the beach. It was overcast. I hadn't, that was the last vacation I had at that point. It was it. I was like, this is, so for her to do what she did to me, knowing what I went through and knowing how alone I was, it was beyond evil and unforgivable. I lived with my aunt in my teens for a short period of time. I would have never done that to her. I wouldn't have done that to anybody. And so she came here to use us, take money, steal, lie, cheat, whatever. And so I was very isolated after she left. Finally, it was like almost a year she was here. Um, I wish it was like eight months. It was about eight months. Uh, I thought, yeah, I had to psych myself out just to, to go through the day. So by the time this man came along, he came into my life and fed me pancakes. He didn't feed me pancakes, but you know what I mean? He was, he used to joke. He's like, I remember when you would take like a half a bite and that's it. That's, that's what you would eat. I'm like, I know I just didn't, I forgot how to eat, but also the chemicals in my body were so messed up that my digestive system didn't work properly. And so, um, if, when I would eat, I'd automatically want to like throw it up and it wasn't, um, bulimia. It wasn't, I wasn't purposely trying to get sick. It was, um, it was so fucked up. So when he came along, he, f he brought out all of that in me, the me, the real me, the person that I had hid away for so long, it came back and I felt like a new person. I just felt like, oh my God. Um, yeah. So when it turned bad, it was almost like I didn't want to let it go because this is the person that changed everything. Him and the doctor and of course, Wally, it was like they changed everything in my life. It wasn't a sexual relationship. It was weird. It was just, he was like my best friend. We didn't really make out either. I don't even know what the hell that relationship was, but it was meant to be because without that happening, I don't think I could have been prepared for a roommate, especially like Roger and the cats and all of that. I didn't, I don't think I would have been there. So everything happens for a reason. So this thyroid thing was finally diagnosed. Um, I'm trying to sum it up because I've been going on for 40 minutes was finally diagnosed. And ever since it's been kind of up and down, you know, I get the medication has to be spot on and I can't really afford to see the doctor anymore. She's a house call doctor and I can't find a local doctor that kind of specializes in this. There's a lot of them in LA, but I don't know. I can't really, I, you know, I don't think my insurance covers it. We'll see what happens right now. I'm in the process of looking for a new doctor. So the doctor that I have, the house call doctor needs to see me. She needs to take, do blood tests and all of that. I just can't afford to do that right now. And so until then she says, well, since she told me to weigh myself, of course, I lost a few pounds, like three pounds, no big deal. And I mean, I still have the belly. I still got everything, all the I'm so good. I don't feel, I'm not scared because usually when I lose weight like that, I get really scared. Um, so she's like, I have to come over and take your blood. I have to do a checkup. And I'm like, I don't have, it's not that much, but it's a lot for me. It's like $250 to get her over here. And I'm like, I, I just don't have it. I don't have the money and I don't know anyone else that I could go to locally because yeah, the old doctor that I used to go to, um, while I was, you know, taking care of my father, he's there, but he also, you know, watched me deteriorating. He saw how skinny I was and he did nothing and he knew nothing about thyroid. <laughs> and then, so there's women doctors, gynecologists and what have you. And, um, they don't take my insurance. So it would cost quite a bit of money to see them. But also there's none that specialize in the thyroid. So I don't know what the hell I'm going to do. I'm going to have to drive to LA, the Valley. I don't know, at least an hour away, but we'll see what happens. Um, so uh, I'm going to post some information on the video and hopefully if you want, you could stop it and see, but if you think that you have a thyroid disease or what have you, um, 
try to get some help. I'm trying to find this article I found because this is what I have. This is what I was told I had. It was called Hash, Hashimoto's thyroid, uh, thyroiditis. Thyroiditis, yeah. Um, it's like hypothyroidism. It's an autoimmune form of hypothyroidism that involves the production of anti-immune thyroid antibodies. So it's like lupus. Um, my doctor said, oh, I think you, you might have lupus because I have, there's more to what I have than just, I think it started off maybe that way, just with hypothyroidism. So the two antibiotics are um, of concern. Sorry, my eyes are so red right now. I've been like, you know, mourning and what have you. So I should do a whole show just on this too, which I'm trying to do right now. I'm trying to do a show on thyroidism. Um, but I always end up going on a tangent. So this is about uh, caregiver's burnout uh, and mostly thyroidism, I think. Okay, so this whole article they have on it. Um, yeah, it's really, it's really tough. It's an autoimmune disease, and it stems from estrogen effects on your uh, thymus gland. The thymus gland sits right behind your breastbone, and it plays an important role of regulating your immune system. <sighs> so, yeah, obviously, I really need someone who specializes in this, definitely. Um, uh, let me see what else it says. Um, it stimulates your thyroid gland to pr produce more thyroid hormone, estrogen. Estro estrogen stimulates your thyroid gland to produce more thyroid hormone. And I think that's why people get it when they start becoming hormonal. Um, it's all connected. I didn't really know that. It also inhibits your thyroid gland from releasing that thyroid hormone. The cause is a buildup of thyroid hormone collode, collode within your thyroid gland. Um, so, yeah, she said it was lupus, but she said it could be this. This is what it could be. So there is like this medication for it that um, I wouldn't take because it's not prescribed. I feel like I need a, a professional to do that. Uh, physical injury to thyroid tissue, bacteria, vitamin D deficiency could cause this. So if you have like hypothyroidism and you don't get enough sun, um, sunlight, or just enough vitamin D, which I take every day. I take a few of those because, yeah, sometimes it's not sunny and, yeah. So um, it puts you at a much greater risk of getting arthritis, multiple sclerosis, lupus, you know, it's all about the estro estrogen. Yeah. And, uh, it's just so hard being a woman, <laughs> you know, like men don't really understand how hard it is. Um, it's not just about like periods and giving birth and getting pregnant and all that stuff. There's so much more to all of this and it's really scary. And, um, We'll talk about it some more, but I know a few of you are, have already contacted me on here, uh, talking about your thyroid disease and, um, condition. And so, yeah, let's talk about it. You know, it's, it really does affect our lives so greatly. And the amount of medication that you get is so important. And if it's off just by a little bit, uh, then it could just put everything out of, out of whack. All right, so I'm going to go, and I, as I said, I have some videos that are private. If you want to see those, you could join, and um, yeah, let's talk about it. Let's talk about all of this, and my hair is drying as the show, as I've been talking. It's getting dry. This is what happens. It gets all curly. 
not like it used to when I was younger, which is, yeah, you know, and once you start going gray, which by the way, stress is making my grays come back even quicker. <sighs> okay. So thyroid disease, hypothyroidism, hypnothyroidism, all of that, lupus, it's caregivers burnout, all of that. It's, it affects us all. All right, everyone. Peace out.